Hello and welcome to another Alatea Foundation podcast. My name is Stephen Cole. I'll be hosting today's interview and I'm joined by Mr. Harry Seeley, who will be sharing his thoughts and insights on our new podcast series topic, Energy Transitions, or Back to Business as Usual. Harry is the chairman and founding member of the Middle East and North African chapter of Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment, or IEMA, which is an international body comprising over 16,000 sustainability and environmental professionals collectively working to facilitate the transition to a more sustainable world. IEMA's raison d'etre, or reason for being, includes provision of support to advance the profession of those who manage and assess aspects of environmental change. Harry Seeley is also a fellow of IEMA organization. He has over 20 years experience in environmental management that has spanned working on the planning, design, and environmental compliance of a wide variety of major projects, from offshore marine renewables and interconnector power cables to onshore gas pipelines, from major tunneling expressway projects to coastal resorts, ports, marinas. And that journey has taken him from Europe to the eastern Siberia and since 2021 to Qatar's somewhat different desert climate. Before we jump into this interview, I would also like to remind all of our listeners to please visit the Foundation's website at www.abhafoundation.org and follow the Foundation on Twitter at at AlatiaFNDN. So, good afternoon. Harry, and welcome to this podcast. Good afternoon, Stephen. Thank you very much indeed for your kind introduction, and it's an absolute pleasure and an honor to uh, join the Alatea Foundation podcast this evening on behalf of the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. So thank you. Thanks, Harry. Well, let, let's start with the role of IEMA. Some of the Foundation's listeners may not be fully aware of the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment's international role. Can you tell us more about that? For sure, yes. So IEMA's efforts in, in Qatar are basically 100% voluntary, completely non-commercial, non-political. Uh, the Institute is UK-based, um, but seeking to, to rapidly extend presence internationally. And uh, we have uh, over 16,000 members in many different countries internationally with branches in Australia, here in Qatar, the Middle East, and also emerging in, in Switzerland and in Ireland also. So a, a, a truly global organization, Harry. Um, and uh, as you said, IEMA is a volunteer organization in Qatar and the MENA region. Can you explain what the role is of IEMA in Qatar and what initiatives uh, IMA undertake locally, and perhaps also explain uh, how you came to win an award for the best volunteer organization in <laughs> IMA. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, I mean, in, in Qatar, and indeed in internationally, um, the main focus of volunteering organizations is to, to provide a facility for other environmental and sustainable professionals to, to network, engage, and, and share ideas. So here in, in Qatar, our primary objective is to, to facilitate the information exchange and networking between uh, environmental sustainability professionals, and need to highlight internationally the good work being done here in Qatar on sustainability. So we've been achieving this primarily by providing presentations at meetings of other professional institutes, um, industry workshops, uh, conferences, and supporting, for example, the judging panel of Qatar Green Building Council uh, Sustainability Awards last year. So we've we've also in the past pre-COVID uh, run seminars on key topics which have been open to uh, any members of both members and non-members of IEMA in the wider community here in Qatar, and they've always been very well attended. So so basically the aim is to to raise awareness among the professional community on topics of, of key importance to advancing sustainability in Qatar. So for example, like water resource management, construction management, uh, climate change uh, action and uh, adaption resilience and, and circular economy. Um, and uh, regarding the award, yeah, it was, it was a nice surprise last year to, to, to receive the, the best volunteer category in the IEMA Sustainability Impact Awards uh, for our efforts in, in the region over the last few years. Yeah, congratulations again on that award. Um, I mean, th th those two areas are key, international cooperation 
and uh, building awareness, but in, in country capacity building and localization of activities, well, they're both topics that are getting serious attention now in Qatar. Can you um, tell us more or describe how IMA assists in bringing those important subjects to fruition? And I assume that IMA is very focused on the training of environmental engineers. Sure, I mean, they, they are very important topics, um, but as our active presence here comprises voluntary activities as mentioned that um, our direct involvement in training is limited to provision of the talks and you know, the, the, the events that I've mentioned earlier. Um, however, IEMA training courses are accessible internationally via registered training companies, uh, including several here in, in Qatar. Um, and these training organizations, they will have completed the, the strict review and accreditation process uh, with IEMA's full-time team back in the UK. So anybody taking those courses can be confident that uh, they, are, they are quality training providers and the course content is is uh, is of benefit to their career. Um, and from the perspective of, of Qatar, in, in country capacity building and localization of activities, as you as you mentioned, they're you know quite rightly in sharp focus. Uh, because you know looking to the future, it's of key importance that this nation continues to build its own domestic skill base of, of qualified and experienced environmental sustainability professionals um, towards basically reducing um, so much resilient or reliance on on expatriate expertise. And one of the things I've, I've noticed over over my eight or nine years here in Qatar, I came to Qatar in 2012, was was basically that even though as, as much as we try not to fall into this trap, it's sometimes uh, easy to forget that the, the so-called cookie cutter approach to implementing an approach in Qatar uh, that has been shown to work well in the US or Europe is, is, is not always appropriate. Uh, it's uh, important to properly consider the potential need to adapt the environment, uh, adapt to the, that uh, environmental, climatic or cultural context of, of here in Qatar. Uh, which is sometimes um, overlooked. And without the appropriate knowledge and especially cultural sensitivity, tailoring such considerations, uh, especially regarding the design rollout of longer term strategies can, can take some time. Um, but therein, Stephen, lies the, the key challenge. We're basically out of time. When it comes to, to, to climate change action, the, the, the time for, for talking uh, shop is, is over. Um, the last 30, 40 years is what the international community have spent um, sitting around tables basically doing that. And it wasn't until 2015 that something really finally tangible came out that, that people were able to, uh, to sign up to. So, I mean, there's, as we can see, that there's uh, an unprecedented annual uh, un unprecedented increase in annual temperatures uh, and the scale of forest fires from, you know, even from the Ar Ar Arctic through to Australia. Uh, unprecedented scale of coral reef die-offs and declines in biodiversity. All this must, you know, really sound some some serious alarms to us. Um, which uh, it, it it seems that gradually that that traction is happening, uh, but probably not not fast enough. Um, but within the context of Qatar, that action on climate change must be appropriate to the context of Qatar. Uh, and effective to ensure the long-term resilience of the nation so that uh, when we have these growing challenges associated with climate change across the, the human, social, environmental and economic spectrum as set out in, in Qatar's National Vision 2030, uh, it's done appropriately. And dare I say, nobody knows Qatar better than Qataris. So it is really important that uh, Qataris are instrumental in the designing and driving this transition to a sustainability for this nation. Absolutely right. And uh, as you say, it's... Um... It's not moving fast enough, but it is getting faster, I detect. And the two very big conferences this year, Kunming and Glasgow, to talk about it and perhaps uh, accelerate progress on that. But I, I wonder if we should be talking about energy efficiency as well. Is, is that a subject that IEMA is concerned with at present? And Because uh, I've read that standards such as building codes are one where improvements can be made. Perhaps the codes are sufficient for a new building, but uh, do existing infrastructure uh, pose a problem? 
Energy efficiency is just basically one of, of a range of key topics to, to be redressed within the, the wider realm of climate action. Um, however, but and within, within IEMA, in the UK, for example, we're, we'd be actively involved in government panels and advisory boards that set these standards and, and provide the uh, public commentary, commentary on, on, on draft regulations. But that's, that's not our role here in the Middle East. Um, so here, it really is just comprising of a network of professionals uh, to simply encourage the sharing of best practice between sectors and indeed, you know, highlight the emerging megatrends and, and what can be done to, uh, to improve situations. So ultimately, it's, it's up to the authorities to decide on the best course for the development of standards and codes. Um, but meanwhile, within our respective professional careers, we, have, uh, we certainly have a duty to our host country um, to, and to our clients to advise on, on how to best affect the positive change for, for the good of the nation um, and to, to make these step changes that are so dramatically um, and, and urgently needed within within society, not just in Qatar, but uh, and, and and even in the, the Gulf region, but internationally. What about uh, air, the quality of air and uh, discharge water quality in Qatar? Is uh, are those part of any environmental study? And does uh, IEMA conduct such such studies, or is it just what environmental engineers do as part of their job? Well, in Qatar for, for quite a few years now, um, there is, uh, I think, widespread recognition by the authorities that uh, management of water is a key issue and also management of air quality is a key issue. And let's not forget that there is a significant uh, natural um, uh, issues associated with you know, sandstorms, for example, in the area that uh, we can do little or nothing to control. But um, there are ongoing and expanding air quality and water quality programs being implemented by the authorities in Qatar for, for some time. For example, there's a, there's a very extensive groundwater monitoring program in one of the industrial cities, um, indeed in the wider, wider Qatar area. And similarly, air quality, as I mentioned, is, is a topic of, of real importance, as indicated by the specific mention in the national strategic plans, where both uh, air and water quality and modeling are, are typical requirements in, in uh, nearly all significant EIAs. It's um, anybody that works in the environmental impact assessment sector here in Qatar would be very aware of the uh, Ministry of Municipality and Environment's uh, strict um, focus in on both those subjects, groundwater modeling and monitoring uh, surface uh, water runoff and discharge to the marine environment. And the quality of the, the water associated with that is, is very important, as is making sure that there's um, significant baseline data for air quality, PM10, PM2.5, and a range of other um, air quality impurities that, uh, that, that, that are measured as part of baseline assessments in, in the vast majority of uh, projects uh, before they are approved by the ministry. But um, IEM as an institute doesn't conduct such studies, um, though as a, an ever-growing number of environmental professionals are recognizing the value of the institute to supporting their respective careers, many of those undertaking the EIA studies also just happen to be members of IEMA. Of course, in Qatar, IEMA is a volunteer organization, as you've explained, and you're employed uh, by a consultancy as an environmental sustainability specialist. Uh, does that mean that there are occasionally conflicts of interest uh, or conflicts of responsibility, perhaps, uh, between your employment role and that of the chairman of AIMA locally? Um, actually, to be honest, Stephen, on the contrary, uh, key elements of my employer, Jacobs, um, key elements of our sustainability strategy are to encourage our Jacobs staff to volunteer and to engage in, in community outreach in initiatives. So my role as the regional chair actually aligns with both these elements. Um, but uh, you know, all members of the IMA steering group uh, in, in Qatar are all volunteers from multiple different sectors. Uh, doing so, dare I say, in their, their own personal time and capacity and, and not representing their organization. Um, so that enables us to, to draw on a very wide perspective of, of opinions and understanding of the important matters in, in Qatar that uh, therefore helps us also to, to focus in on, on uh, associated topics. Um, and indeed, as the community of IEMA members continues to grow in Qatar and the region, so too does the, the opportunity to share experience, uh, notwithstanding the need to protect client confidentially, confidentiality at all times, of course. But what we have seen is that uh, the networking events, uh, especially pre-COVID, 
um, actually facilitated new introductions between attending stakeholders and enabling new collaborations to form initiatives to be explored and uh, resolution of um, mutually shared issues. So overall, no, there, there isn't a conflict there. In fact, if anything, it, um, it enhances and enriches the, the ability of the professional um, sectors within the, the environmental and sustainability professional community in, in, in Qatar to, to come together and uh, work better together. I mean, obviously, we're, there's, there's a long way to go. Um, and what we're able to do with the small number of volunteers that we have is, is only a fraction of what actually needs to be done. But it, it certainly uh, shows that there's, there's an indicated willingness and, and thirst within the community to, um, to pull more closely together for, for the better of the country. Well, let, let's find out how, uh, how people can actually take a greater role in AIMA, within AIMA. How, how does one join and how do you describe the levels of membership? Sure, thanks. Thanks for that, Stephen. I mean, the, the good thing is that um, you don't necessarily have to have any sort of uh, an environment or sustainability background to, to be able to join IEMA. In fact, the, the structure of IEMA membership grades is such that anyone can join, regardless of their background and expertise. So, for example, the, the affiliate member is the most readily accessible route, requiring you know, no prior examinations or formal submissions or interviews, and that can be completed literally within a few minutes online. Um, if, if people log on to the, the website, which uh, is www.iema, I-E-M for Mike, A for Alpha, dot net, N-E-T. Um, and the, the other grades then, the professional related grades start at student level and progress to graduate through to associate and practitioner, uh, and then on to the full membership, uh, which you can do combined with the uh, chartership. And finally, fellow, the fellow being the, the highest level. So basically, from a, a student and affiliate members, they can they can join without any prior knowledge. Um, the other grades uh, are more focused on specific levels of knowledge within that that sector. So that is more um, that is more difficult, but and challenging to to acquire. Uh, but not impossible for any by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and indeed, the, the website is set up so that there's plenty of guidance on anyone that wants to go for a particular level so that they uh, they can go for the, the exam or the assessment uh, whenever they're ready. Um, so they can take as much time as they want to to uh, to prepare for that. Um, in fact, the, the, the website itself provides very user friendly guide for anybody wondering which level is not suitable for them. Um, so that you can go in and you can basically follow the guidance there and come to your own conclusions about what uh, what level you want to go for. Oh, thanks, Harry, for that clarity. Uh, IEMA also approves training course providers to deliver environmental training. And um, there are currently over 60 IEMA approved training providers, 60. How does an organization become an approved training course provider? And um, what kind of certification can one provide to successful attendees of such courses? Well, as, as you say, we have our, our um, list of, of training organizations that have been accredited, um, and they're both training providers in the UK and internationally, including, as I think I mentioned earlier, several in the Middle East. Um, the accreditation requirements are strict, um, and they're regularly reviewed annually to, to ensure the IMS standards of training are upheld and delivered regardless of, of where that might be internationally. Um, and uh, the applicant organizations, they need to demonstrate their legitimacy as, as an entity themselves, and also the qualifications and teaching expertise or experience of, of their, uh, their proposed instructors. Um, where classroom teaching is desired, then the applicant organization has to demonstrate the feasibility and quality of the facilities proposed. Uh, and all such requested evidence is then carefully reviewed by IEMA's full-time specialists back in the UK who are dedicated to this role to, to ensure that a high standard of course delivery is maintained. Um, I mean, what's, there's, there's nothing more important than maintaining the, the quality of, of the brand and the reputation of the Institute. Um, and by, by default, it's really important that any organizations that are uh, accredited to deliver IEMA training courses have met that rigorous standard of, uh, of review. Uh, so that attendees then can obviously have that assurance that they're they're attending quality um, uh, institute uh, quality training providers. 
as we all know, we're right in the middle of a pandemic. In terms of environmental standards, do you see a slipping or a relaxation of standards while the pandemic goes on? We know national societies from India to Italy saw initial improvements in air quality because of lockdowns in urban areas as lockdowns reduce traffic. But is the reduction in air traffic also reducing air pollution? Well, as awful as the impacts of COVID have been on personal lives and commerce, and most certainly they have been devastating, um, if there's one slight glimmer of a silver lining, it has been the ability of uh, us to have a very rare and albeit temporary fleeting snapshot of what happens when human activity is paused for a moment. Uh, indeed, I think you, you, you mentioned some examples there of uh, in Italy and uh, India where air quality was uh, w- was visibly improved within a very short space of time. Um, but, you know, the, the estimates are that the, the, the CO2 equivalent emissions dropped in 2020 by about 2.4 billion tonnes, which sounds a lot, but it's actually only 7% of the total emissions. Uh, and to put this into context, the United Nations Emissions Gap Report, which came out in, in just December of uh, last year, highlighted we need to cut CO2 uh, equivalent emissions by 7.6% annually for the next 10 years to have any chance of keeping up with the global temperature rise uh, below the one5 targets set out in the Paris Accord. So so basically what we're saying is that every year for the next 10 years, we need to have almost the same level of CO2 reductions uh, that have been made possible only by the, the pandemic and the cessation of so much transportation, uh, not just air traffic, but especially road traffic um, to, to, to put us in that situation. So in, in fact, the, the currently published commitments are, are nowhere near enough to put us on track for a, a three degree uh, temperature rise by uh, 2100. So the, the issue is that we are very far away from what we need to be doing. So there is still time to affect change and avert this disaster. But we, we need to understand that at this point in time, we're, we're at an inflection point and there is no more time for international procrastination. In fact, two days ago, the United Nations brought out another report which demonstrated that uh, despite all the announcements that we've seen over the last year, two years, or indeed since the, the Paris Accord, that if all those targets were met, it would still only represent a 1% reduction in uh, carbon emissions um, incredible. in the next 10 years. And we need to get to 25% reduction if uh, if we want to hit the uh, two degree limit. Um, and in fact, uh, a 45% uh, percent reduction if we want to get to uh, a 1.5 degree limit. So, you know, we're not in a good place at the moment. And there definitely needs to be a step change uh, across all nations, across all industries to uh, to really um, to look at what we can do seriously. But to, to drop back to your, your initial point about um, air traffic, the regarding the influence of air transportation in 2020, it dropped by about 60%, I think, are the, the general estimates. But in fact, air transport is estimated to represent only 2% of global emissions. And in fact, only 12% of all transport emissions compared to 74% uh, from, from road transport. So um, as... Uh, as, as, as much as it might have been nice to think that uh, the cessation in air traffic would have been a great help, uh, in fact, we can see that uh, air transport alone represents a relatively small percentage of, of global emissions in, in CO2. Well, that's a very powerful argument uh, you make there, Harry. So, and I think that's a, a good time uh, to end this podcast. I think time's up. But thank you so much, Harry Seeley, for sharing your views on what AIMA might achieve in 2021. Watch this space for the next Alatia podcast in the series. I'm Stephen Cole. Thank you and goodbye.